questions. We turn now to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This week we learn that at Trinity Academy in Edinburgh, children are having to be taught maths by teachers from other subjects, and the situation is so bad the school has written to parents to ask them to help out. All because of this government's failure to train up enough new staff. We know it's happened in Perthshire. We now know it's happening in Edinburgh. Can the First Minister just confirm that this is not more widespread and that it's not happening anywhere else as well? First well, Minister. As, as Ruth Davidson and other members are aware, we, like many other countries, face a challenge in teacher recruitment. At the start of the at school term in August, the vacancy rate was around, just above, I think, uh, to be precise, 1% of the total uh, number of teachers, and that is uh, a vacancy rate that we would expect to reduce as the school term proceeds. So we face that challenge, and uh, nobody within the government has ever sought to say otherwise. But that's exactly why we are taking a range of actions to deal with and address that challenge. Let me just set out again what some of those actions are. We have increased student teacher uh, intakes for six years in a row. Uh, back in 2011, uh, the intake to student teaching was uh, 2,297. Uh, in the most recent year, it was over 4,000. Uh, we had uh, 231 more uh, newly qualified probationer teachers starting the induction scheme in August compared to the previous year. Uh, we've also recently launched the next phase of the teacher recruitment campaign. Uh, we're developing a national approach to support recruitment of teachers from outside of Scotland, developing a specific campaign for head teachers uh, recruitment. And of course, uh, we are also finalising right now a specification for a new route into teaching to help us even further attract teachers, uh, particularly to parts of the country or to particular subjects that are under pressure. So these are the range of actions we are taking to tackle a challenge that is in no way unique to Scotland. But let me say, uh, finally, presiding officer, uh, what the biggest threat is to all of that action we are taking. It is, of course, the restrictions uh, that Ruth Davidson's party want to put on the ability of people, teachers, nurses, doctors, to come to this country from other parts of Europe. That, as in so many other areas, is the biggest challenge that we now face. Ruth Davidson. From a government that cut 4,000 teaching posts before Brexit even happened, that is the most pathetic excuse I have ever heard. And if that's supposed to cover up for the fact that the First Minister didn't answer my question and clearly doesn't know if this is happening elsewhere, then it's not going to work. The first thing she should have done was to get on the phone and find out. Because teacher shortages aren't just in Perthshire and they're not just in Edinburgh. For the schools coming back last month, Angus Council, for example, asked the Scottish Government for 40 probationer teachers to cover the staff shortages in their area. They got about half, they got 23. So children starting school knowing that there aren't enough teachers to do the job. Now in May, John Swinney admitted that this government's cuts to teacher training probably went too far. With all that we know now, shouldn't that probably be a definitely? Minister, First Minister. Two, two things just uh, to preface my substantive remarks in answer to Ruth Davidson's question. Firstly, I started my first answer by recognising that teacher recruitment was a challenge in all parts of Scotland. Secondly, it's interesting that in order to uh, back up her uh, flawed and false narrative that this is somehow uniquely down to actions of this government, Ruth Davidson has to go back several <laughs> years and go back to a point when her party and other parties across this chamber were regularly coming to FMQs to ask uh, my predecessor and the then Education Secretary about the problem of teacher unemployment because they thought we were training too many teachers uh, for the jobs that were available. In the last six years, in every single one of the past six years, we have been increasing the number of student teachers going into teacher training. And uh, Ruth Davidson mentions probationer uh, teachers. As I said in my original answer, 231 uh, uh, additional newly qualified probationers starting uh, the induction scheme this August as compared to last August. So in terms of numbers, in terms of the other actions we are taking, uh, we are addressing what is a difficult challenge for Scotland and for many other parts of the world as well. But Ruth Davidson hasn't yet addressed a very relevant point. As we are working in all of the ways I've set out to increase the numbers coming into teaching, to try to attract teachers from 
other parts of the world to come uh, and use their talents here in Scotland. Her party is trying to put the shutters up and stop people coming in. So if she wants to be taken seriously on this issue, she should at least have the good grace to address that issue. Ruth Davidson. The First Minister wants me to talk about people coming to teach here from outside Scotland, so let's talk about that. For years, we have been calling for people who have qualified outside Scotland and want to teach here to be fast-tracked, which is just one of the ways to help. Now, yesterday, yesterday, we received an email from a couple who moved to Scotland five years ago. The husband did his teacher training in maths and he worked down south for 15 years as a maths teacher. And when he moved here, he was told he couldn't teach maths anymore without a full year's retraining as a student. So that is a qualified maths teacher not allowed to teach maths in Scotland. And he's not alone. We have a crippling shortage of teachers, but according to evidence presented to this parliament this year, we had more than 550 qualified teachers from outside Scotland applying to teach here, but who've been told by this government to go back to school themselves. Now, we have been asking for years to speed this up as a way to help. So why has there been a delay in implementing that? First Minister. Unfortunately for Ruth Davidson, I received that email as well yesterday. So I've been able to look into it. Uh, the circumstances, well, you see, my answer is going to include something that I would have thought Ruth Davidson would have known. Uh, but since she clearly doesn't, I'm going to tell her about it. The circumstances narrated in that email, and I'm very grateful to the woman who sent it to me, uh, relate back to 2012. Since then, and this is the bit I would have thought that Ruth Davidson, if she was going to raise this today, might actually have been aware of. You see, because since then, the General Teaching Council for Scotland has introduced provisional conditional registration, which allows teachers qualified outside Scotland to become registered and to take up a teaching post in Scotland while they work towards meeting the minimum requirements. So Ruth Davidson, Ruth Davidson asks me, why haven't we fixed that? Well, I'm afraid, Ms Davidson, the answer is we have. You just didn't bother to do the research to find out. So that individual... That individual... Well, well, absolutely right, he would not have been able uh, to teach in 2012, may now be in a position to do so, which is why we will be contacting that individual to see if he wants to take up a teaching post. Uh, and that is the change in circumstances that, frankly, I'm quite gobsmacked Ruth Davidson didn't bother to find out before she came here. Ruth Davidson. Her? didn't bring to the table was that this was only talked about by the General Teaching Council in May of this year and hasn't been brought through yet. So it's smoke and mirrors. Again, again, the First Minister stands here and says, this is my top priority. And after 10 years of government and 10 years of failure, I want a herogram for only now beginning to try and fix... Let's hear the question, please. ...for years. But the record that you cannot run away from is this. 10 years in power, 4,000 fewer teachers, 40% of teachers... Just one second, please. Please, let's hear the question, Ms Davison. Yeah. The record. They don't want to hear it, but let's say it again, presiding officer. You're absolutely right. 4,000 fewer teachers on her watch. 40% of Scottish teachers considering retirement over 18 months. Hundreds of qualified teachers being held up of getting into classrooms because of this government's bureaucracy. And for all the promises of the future, that is the record of 10 years of failing our children. A pass mark or a fail, First Minister? A fail. First Minister. You always know when Ruth Davidson has lost the plot at First Minister's questions because we just get the angry waffling in place of a question. But let me say again, this government, this government is taking action. Clearly some of it Ruth Davidson wants to ignore and some of it she just doesn't even bother to find out about. The truth of the matter is Ruth Davidson's not interested in solutions. She's just interested in standing up here 
talking about the problems. So we'll continue to take the action that is right for our education system, right for our teachers and right for young people across this country. And we'll leave the Tories, unfortunately, to continue to do the damage they're doing to this country through their reckless Brexit approach, which is going to make finding the solutions to issues like this all the harder, something Ruth Davidson never, ever wants to talk about. Question number two, Alec Rowley. President officer, it is three months since we witnessed the horror of the fire that engulfed Grenfell Tower, killing at least eight uh, people. We have since heard from many experts that fire sprinklers and high-rise flats can play a vital role in saving lives. I know the government have set up a ministerial working group which met for the first time on the 20th of June, and I do look forward to hear what recommendations they will make. However, can the First Minister comment on the submission from the Fire Brigade's Union at yesterday's local government committee when they said, and I quote, Scotland has lost 24% of its fire safety inspecting officers since 2013-14. First Minister. Well, of course, it is a responsibility of the Fire and Rescue Service to make sure they have the right staff uh, doing the right jobs in the right place. I uh, understand that uh, the 68 uniform fire safety enforcement officers that are deployed across Scotland, which I think was the number uh, that was referred to yesterday, are supplemented by 13 specialist non-uniform uh, auditing officers. And additionally, the Fire and Rescue Service has a team of senior fire officers who are also competent in fire safety enforcement, thereby ensuring a national 24-7 capability to respond to fire safety related uh, matters. Uh, and of course, in uh, the budget uh, for this year, we increased the overall operational uh, budget by £21.7 million pounds to support investment in equipment and resources. These are hugely serious issues and we will continue uh, to work very closely with the, the Fire and Rescue Service, but also listen very carefully uh, to the views of, of staff uh, in all of these matters. As Alec Rowley uh, rightly says, we established, following the Grenfell uh, tragedy, a ministerial uh, working group. That working group has now met on a number of occasions, uh, most recently met uh, last week, and is considering all relevant measures to ensure the safety of residents in high-rise domestic buildings. And since Alec Rowley specifically mentioned sprinklers, that, of course, includes a review of the evidence on sprinklers. Uh, we will continue to work through that group and more generally uh, with all uh, relevant stakeholders and partners here to ensure that we are doing absolutely everything uh, to ensure the safety of people who live in high-rise uh, buildings and other relevant buildings across the country. Alec Rowley. But it is of course the responsibility of government to make sure that the fire and rescue service have the resources that they need. I have. I have talked with many firefighters and have met with the Fire Brigade's Union, and I have to say there are some serious concerns being raised. Despite assurances from ministers to protect the front line, the FBU say that over 700 frontline firefighters' jobs have gone. There are growing concerns about adequate staffing levels and the future of fire stations. Will the First Minister give an assurance to Parliament that there will be no further job cuts in our fire service and no programme of fire service closures introduced across Scotland. First Minister. Well, I give an absolute assurance we will continue to work with uh, the fire service and work in dialogue with the FBU to make sure that we are protecting uh, those uh, who keep us safe from fire. We have sought to do that and we will continue uh, to work to do that, both in terms of the number of fire officers uh, and others who work in the fire uh, and rescue service and in terms of the configuration of uh, fire stations uh, across our country. Uh, in terms of these issues, I mean, it, we owe an enormous debt of gratitude to all firefighters who uh, do a very dangerous job to keep us safe. And in the aftermath of Grenfell, it is absolutely vital 
that we look uh, carefully and critically at every aspect of fire safety, including all of the ones that have been raised by Alec Rowley today, and we will continue to do that. And as we do that, not only will we uh, talk as we do regularly to the Fire and Rescue Service, we will hear the views of the FBU and those who work within that service and uh, try to come to decisions that are about not just protecting the frontline service, but also making sure that frontline service is configured to keep uh, the people of Scotland safe. So that is a, an assurance that I will give the uh, Justice Secretary and the Minister for Community Safety uh, regularly of discussions uh, about these matters and will continue to do so. Alec Rowley. I mean, we certainly owe a debt of gratitude to all firefighters, of, of that there can be no question. But I do think, and I think the First Minister needs to look again at some of the big issues that are being raised, and I do think we do need some assurances in terms of further job cuts and closures that we've not had today. But can I say, can I say that it's now, it's now four years since the government merged eight fire and rescue services into one, and I'm told that progress remains very slow in terms of harmonising terms and conditions and wages for fire fire firefighters and that uh, this is causing uh, a great impact in terms of staff morale within the fire service and needs to be addressed. Does she accept that a background of continuing cuts to the fire service is unlikely to help and resolve these issues and that cuts cannot be allowed to continue within our fire and rescue service? First Minister. Sure, we are protecting uh, those who, who fight fire and, and keep us safe. As I said, I think uh, I said in an earlier answer to Alec Rowley, uh, in this year's budget, of course, we increased the overall operational budget uh, by over £20 million to support some of the investment that the Fire and Rescue Service uh, need to make. Obviously, there are ongoing uh, negotiations around pay uh, and conditions, and I, I hope uh, these discussions continue in a constructive way. Uh, Alec Rowley has asked me to you know, look carefully at all of these matters, and he's, he's right to do so. We have an absolute responsibility to ensure that we do that at any time, but particularly given the, the tragedy we saw happen in London over this summer. Uh, that's why the ministerial group is looking at all of these individual issues very, very carefully, uh, and recommendations will undoubtedly come forward in due course. But why we also, uh, in a wider sense, continue to have these discussions with the Fire and Rescue Service to make sure uh, that we're putting in place the resources it needs to do the job that the rest of us across the country depend on them to do. And we have a constituency question from Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Today, Sue Ryder published a report on the support available to people with neurological conditions. Featuring the story of Thomas and Dee McGreevy, constituents whose case I have been helping with for several months. Dee, a former nurse who is only 58, has an undiagnosed neurological condition and has been in an older person's care home for the past two years, largely confined to her room for 24 hours a day. Mr McGreevy's tenacity in batting for better support for his wife has been incredible, but very little support is available for Dee and others like her. Will the First Minister agree to look further into the details of my constituent's case? And can she confirm if the Scottish Government will be considering the report's recommendations in full? First Minister. Well, firstly, in terms of the individual constituency case, of course, uh, the Health Secretary will be happy to look at that if Monica Lennon wants to uh, provide the details. In terms of the Sue Ryder report that's been published today, firstly, can I uh, take the opportunity to pay tribute to Sue Ryder? They are a fantastic organisation doing very, very good work. Uh, the Scottish Government works very closely with them uh, and took action based on the priorities they identified last year, which was making progress on data and clinical standards. Uh, this report has made five recommendations and will be taking forward work uh, on all of them. I think perhaps most appropriately uh, today is to mention that we've already started the development of Scotland's first national action plan on neurological conditions. Um, and the Public Health Minister has made clear that she wants to see uh, new standards of care developed for people with neurological conditions as part of that work. Um, I think one final point just to make, which uh, from the, the details that Monica Lennon did share with the Chamber in her question uh, may be uh, relevant to the, the case that she has mentioned today is, of course, our decision to take forward and implement Frank's Law, uh, which will allow uh, those under 65 with some conditions, uh, neurological conditions, of course, to access personal care in the way that those over 65 already can. So in a range of uh, these issues, we are already taking uh, forward action. We'll continue to do so. And as we do so, we'll continue to work closely with uh, the Sue Ryder uh, organisation. Question number three, Willie Rennie. Scottish Education, 
judged by international inspectors as just average. Thousands of classroom assistants lost. Teacher vacancies up to 700. Thousands more want to give up too. And a school less than three miles from Scotland's parliament is desperate for mass teachers. Has the First Minister had any doubts about our government's education programme over the last 10 years? First Minister. Well, as I have said repeatedly, there are many, many, many strengths in the Scottish education system, and I, I don't think it does a service to anybody in that system for us not uh, to point to those. Uh, we've seen uh, a 30 per cent increase in higher passes, for example, under, uh, over the last uh, number of years. We see more young people, particularly from our deprived communities, coming out of school with qualifications and going to university. But I'm equally clear that I want us to go even further. That's why we've got uh, underway right now the most radical programme of reform of school education seen in the lifetime of this Scottish Parliament. Uh, and again, I note, uh, and I'm, you know, it's entirely within his, his right to do so, I, I'm not suggesting otherwise, uh, but I think Willie Rennie is opposing almost every aspect of that reform uh, programme. So we will continue to take forward the actions uh, we think are necessary to ensure improvements in our education system. And of course, in terms of vacancies, as I said uh, to Ruth Davidson, in each and every one of the last six years, we have increased the numbers uh, of student teachers going into teacher training, which is why, again, as I said earlier on, we've got more than 200 additional newly qualified professional teachers starting in our schools uh, this August as compared to last year. Uh, so we will not shy away from these challenges, uh, far from it, but we will continue to focus on taking the action we need to take to address those challenges. Will there any? That was quite an astonishing answer. She's got no doubts about anything she's done in education in the last 10 years. No doubts. She listed all these great things, and I think there are great things about Scottish education. But that in reality, under her leadership, Education has got worse in Scotland over that time. The First Minister knows that Scottish teachers are on the edge. Their pay is lagging way behind those in other countries. A study found there's a potential exodus from teaching with 700 vacancies already. The Macron report was delivered by the Liberal Democrat Labour government. Despite Nicola Sturgeon's opposition, it transformed education and had future teachers queuing up to join the profession. After 10 years of the SNP, that isn't happening anymore. Isn't it time for the First Minister to establish urgently a new Macron inquiry to reinvigorate teaching and have future teachers queuing up once again? First Minister. No, I, I don't actually think the right thing to do is embark on a, a review that could take years to undertake and to complete. I think the better thing to do is to take the actions, the hard, tangible actions that we are taking right now. Whether that's in terms of increasing the number of student teachers coming into the profession, the various initiatives around recruitment that I've already spoken about, whether that is the action we're taking uh, to put more powers and resources into the hands of head teachers, uh, to make sure that head teachers and the teams of teachers they work with are the real leaders of learning in their classrooms, not only good for motivating teachers, but also the evidence tells us uh, the best way to raise standards in our schools as well. So we'll get on uh, with the programme of reform and investment in our schools that we have embarked upon. And I look forward to continuing to debate the detail of that uh, in this chamber. But I hope people will engage on the actions we're taking right now, not do what Willie Rennie appears to be trying to do, just kick everything into the long grass in some review that will take forever and ever to report. We're going to take the action now to deal with the challenges we face. Couple of supplementaries. The first from Richard Lockhead. Is the First Minister aware that the First Secretary of State, Damien Green, has warned this week that if there are no post-Brexit framework agreements across the UK on issues like agriculture, the devolved administrations could adopt policies that are, that are at odds with the UK government's views? In other words, he wants framework agreements drawn up to smother and silence devolution and this Parliament's right to decide what's in the interest of Scotland. Does she agree, therefore, that this is another example of Conservative Minister's strong desire to use Brexit to undermine devolution and Scottish democracy? First Minister. Um, yes, I do agree with that. And it's not, just, it's not just the view of this government. We've seen it in House of Commons briefing papers. We've seen organisations 
like the Law Society, talk about how this uh, withdrawal, EU withdrawal bill is going to centralise powers that should lie with this parliament at, at Westminster. And I think that is wrong and it's a, a deeply retrograde step. I mean, we this uh, week celebrated the 20th anniversary of the devolution referendum. Uh, the Scotland Act on which this uh, parliament is built is based on an important principle that everything is devolved unless it is expressly reserved. This withdrawal bill turns that principle on its head and means that every power, if they come back from the EU, even in devolved areas, are reserved at Westminster unless a UK government decides that they're going to devolve them. And I think Damien Green in his comments uh, reported today kind of gives the game away. The reason they want to do this is to restrict the freedom of decision and manoeuvre uh, of this parliament in devolved areas. And I think there are deeply concerning aspects to this. Take agriculture, for example. You know, he was talking about subsidy wars. Is that code for wanting to reduce the funding that goes to our farmers? Right now, in Scotland, our farmers get 16% of farm funding. We should actually get more than that because of the percentage of land. Uh, do the UK government want to see that reduced? So this is a serious issue. It's got serious uh, consequences for different parts of society and our economy, but it's also serious in principle. Uh, matters that are devolved should be for this parliament to decide. They shouldn't be re-reserved to Westminster to allow a Westminster government to do whatever it sees fit. It's a big, big issue of principle, and I think the Tories would do well uh, to start standing up for this parliament instead of just doing what their bosses at Westminster tell them to do. And Mark Ruskell. Well, perhaps staying with that theme, two weeks ago, Fergus Ewing announced £109 million worth of cuts to the Scottish Rural Development Programme, blaming Westminster on its failure to transfer the EU convergence payments. But our research shows that these convergence payments were never included in the original budget and therefore cannot be the reason behind the cuts. Can the First Minister explain to Parliament what the real reason is behind these cuts to the SRDP programme, which will impact on communities, businesses, and our rural environment. First Minister. Uh, I'm sorry, but the full convergence funding, and this is a, a matter of fact, was not passed on uh, to uh, the UK government. This is additional funding that was made available to the UK, uh, principally because of issues in Scotland that should have come to Scotland, but because it wasn't, Scottish farmers were shortchanged to the tune of £160 million over the course of the CAP programme. So that is the reality. And what we should all be doing in this uh, parliament, I think, is getting behind the call for that uh, wrong to be righted and for farmers to get the money that they are due. We want to question, question number four from Julian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister about the Scottish Government's responses to the number of reported cases involving a child committing a sexual offence against another, increasing by a third over the last four years. First Minister. Well, these figures are extremely concerning, and our priority is to ensure the safety of children. Of course, it is too soon to say to what extent the reported increase reflects an actual rise in offending, because we know that greater confidence in the reporting of sexual offences might also be a factor. Uh, last week, the Deputy First Minister spoke at an education summit organised by the Solicitor General to highlight the importance of a preventative approach in helping to stop children becoming either victims or perpetrators of sexual offending. Uh, our review of personal and social education also supports this. Later this month, we'll also publish new analysis looking at sexual crimes committed through the internet, including the age of both victims and offenders, and that will uh, help to inform how the justice system responds uh, to this type of offending in future. Julian Martin. I thank the First Minister for that answer. Would she join with me in encouraging all schools, youth groups and parent groups to get in, in actively involved in tackling the issues around the sharing of unsolicited images and get involved in initiatives like DigiEye, run by Young Scott? And could she outline what we as MSPs in our areas and government could do respectively to highlight these issues and encourage cyber resilience in young people and their parents? First Minister. That question is, is important. I would particularly mention the DGI uh, campaign that Young Scott uh, runs uh, and has been mentioned by Jilly Martin. The, the government actually supports Young Scott uh, with funding to support that campaign. Uh, and that is just uh, one of a range of actions we are already taking as part of our internet safety action plan. 
Uh, but I think Gillian Martin is right. This is first and foremost and very fundamentally a community issue. And it often takes a community approach to dealing with issues like this uh, effectively. Uh, not all uh, sexual <laughs> offending uh, shown in these statistics will be uh, offences committed on the internet. Of course it won't be, but we know that the internet can often uh, be an unsafe place for young people. So I think all of us as MSPs uh, can play our part in our communities in raising awareness and helping to uh, educate parents about the steps they can take to keep their children safe online. Question number five, Edward Mountain. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to ensure that there is public confidence in the leadership of Police Scotland. First Minister. Well, the Government is committed to ensuring that Police Scotland has a strong, uh, resilient and effective senior leadership team. Uh, as the Cabinet Secretary for Justice set out in his parliamentary statement on Tuesday, uh, Deputy Chief Constable Ian Livingston will provide leadership to Police Scotland in the Chief Constable's absence. As the DCC designate, he will have all the powers of the Chief Constable in this period and, of course, he's very ably supported by the other experienced and capable members of the senior team. Uh, I have confidence that they, along with all of our police officers and staff, will continue to provide the excellent police service that keeps our communities safe and, of course, has helped to bring crime down to a 42-year low. Edward Mountain. Um, I thank the uh, First Minister for that response. This is not about political posturing in difficult times because the public and our police officers must have the unequivocal confidence in the leadership of Police Scotland. Given leadership requires scrutiny and scrutiny requires leadership, and there is currently a perceived vacuum, can the First Minister tell us how she will ensure that the Chief Constable of Scotland will retain or gain the respect of all those that he or she leads and serves? First Minister. Well, of course, I, I, I agree very much with the sentiment of, of that question. Um, the uh, Scottish Police Authority, of course, has been taking a number of steps recently to increase uh, transparency and the ability for scrutiny around uh, its conduct uh, and decision making and I think we should all welcome that. In terms of the Chief Constable, um, your members will appreciate I am not going to nor would it be appropriate for me to comment on the allegations that have been made in relation to the Chief Constable. Uh, what is important to say though is that there is a well established process in place for investigating and coming to conclusions on complaints uh, of the nature that have been made and that process is now underway. I think in those circumstances uh, the Chief Constable was right uh, to take uh, leave of absence, absence while that investigation is underway. In terms of Ian Livingston, uh, Ian Livingston is a senior police officer with many, many years of experience. He will be known to uh, many of us across this chamber. Uh, he is a highly respected uh, officer uh, and I know will do uh, an excellent job while he's carrying out the functions uh, of Chief Constable. So we uh, continue to reassure the public. Uh, Edward Mountain talked about a perception uh, of a, a vacuum and I think it's important that while we uh, of course uh, all members of course have a, a scrutiny role to perform here we do not say to the public that there is a, a vacuum of leadership because there is not uh, there is uh, an acting chief constable in place uh, the chair of the Scottish Police Authority is in place and will continue to be in place until his successor is appointed and again police officers right around our country do an excellent job. They do that excellent job in often very difficult circumstances. Uh, and if we take a step back from all of this and remind ourselves, yet again, crime in this country is a 42 year low and that's down to the hard work of police officers in every part of Scotland. Neil Findlay. Uh, one area of Police Scotland are involved in is undercover policing. Uh, today, lawyers are at the court of session seeking a judicial review of the exclusion of Scottish victims from the UK-wide public inquiry into illegal and unethical undercover policing and the Scottish Government's failure to carry out a parallel inquiry. So what does the First Minister say to the victims, including women who were violated, tricked into relationships, and some who even had children by undercover officers with an assumed identity? That is what some victims describe as state rape. So why is that? no full public inquiry here in Scotland. Well, firstly, First Minister. I, I would deprecate uh, the kind of actions that Neil Finlay uh, has outlined and I would hope that everybody would. Uh, in terms of a court case that Neil Finlay started his question by referring to, he, he said it's in court today. It clearly would be completely inappropriate for me to make any comment 
on uh, that judicial review case. But in terms of the wider issue, uh, Neil Finlay, I, I assume, is aware that there is currently a review uh, underway by Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary uh, into these issues of undercover uh, policing. Uh, and of course, that will uh, conclude in due course. And if there are recommendations for the Scottish Government uh, involved there, we will take uh, those recommendations forward. Thank you. Question number six, Daniel Johnson. To ask the First Minister what progress the Scottish Government has made in the identification of combustible cladding on public buildings in light of reports that it was found at Edinburgh Royal Infirmary. First Minister. Well, following the Grenfell tragedy, the Ministerial Working Group on Building and Fire Safety focused on identifying combustible cladding on high-rise buildings over 18 metres in height. Uh, the NHS has identified two hospitals, the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital and the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh, where some combustible cladding is present. Uh, the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, however, has confirmed that patients are safe, and that is because there are other fire stopping measures and good fire safety management procedures in place at both hospitals. Daniel Johnson. I thank the First Minister for that response. Um, as Alec Rowley pointed out in his questions earlier on, today marks the three-month anniversary of the tragic fire at Grenfell Tower. Over those three months, combustible cladding has been found in schools, university buildings, hospitals in Glasgow, and now in Edinburgh, as reported in recent days. In light of that information, will the First Minister tell Parliament how many and what publicly accessible buildings still remain to be checked? What does she believe, uh, sorry, when does she believe that the government will have a comprehensive picture of the use of combustible cladding? And can she confirm how she will keep Parliament informed and up to date with the progress towards this comprehensive picture? First Minister. Well, well, firstly, as I, I should have said earlier on, I think uh, it is appropriate to say that uh, at, at this moment in time, our thoughts should particularly be with the victims uh, of Grenfell and their families, uh, given the, the three months that have passed and also uh, the opening of, of the inquiry into that. This will be every day of the last three months will have been incredibly difficult. But uh, as these issues start to be looked into, uh, that trauma, uh, of course, is, is underlined. Um, there has been a ongoing transparency as we've done this work. As, as the member will be aware, uh, we have focused, uh, for reasons that I think everybody will both understand and agree with, on buildings over 18 metres in height. The reason for that is, of course, for buildings underneath that height, uh, it is more possible for the fire uh, service to, to gain access in the event uh, of fire. And the Ministerial Working Group has been very open about its deliberations um, and the work uh, around hospitals, uh, well, high-rise uh, flats, domestic dwellings in the first place, hospitals and schools. Uh, there has been reporting of that uh, as that work has been carried out. I will ask uh, Angela Constance to write to the member with a full and up-to-date uh, detail of, of exactly where that work uh, has got to. And all along, uh, if issues have been identified, uh, steps are being taken to mitigate any risks. So, for example, the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, when uh, cladding uh, there of a particular type was identified, uh, the Health Board set out the steps it was going to take to remove that cladding in the Edinburgh Royal Infirmary, where I should say there are further tests being carried out on that cladding, uh, but notwithstanding that, particular uh, mitigations have been put in place to make sure that the safety of patients and anybody visiting the hospital is absolutely paramount. So we will continue to update Parliament uh, as appropriate on this work. And as I say, I will ask Angela Constance to write uh, an update letter to the member setting out exactly uh, what work remains uh, to be carried out. And Bob Doris. Uh, First Minister, fire safety goes beyond issues of combustible cladding. The Local Government Committee has heard a suggestion from the FBU that there should be a series of intrusive inspections of high rises in Scotland to interrogate fire safety procedures and take the opportunity to improve fire safety further. Uh, First Minister, can I ask if this is something that the Scottish Government will give consideration to? First Minister. Um, we will, of course, continue to give consideration to any uh, suggestions that are made, particularly those coming from uh, the experts in, in fire safety. Uh, we are, the, through the Ministerial Working Group, uh, we are already carrying out a review of building and fire safety regulatory frameworks uh, and any other uh, relevant matters. Uh, I think it's important to say that no ACM, uh, which was the particular cladding uh, on Grenfell, no uh, cladding of that particular type has been found on any high-rise social blocks uh, in Scotland. Uh, we would expect all building owners to have been doing their own fire safety risk assessments. And of course, if they have any concerns, uh, they should seek further advice from the fire service. But we will, uh, through the working group, continue to consider all relevant measures. I've already mentioned the work that's been carried out around sprinklers, but also the suggestion uh, that Bob Doris uh, highlights today will be taken fully into account in the deliberations of the working group. 
Question number seven, Marie Todd. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister how the Scottish Government is marking the 20th anniversary of the devolution referendum. First Minister. Uh, well, like many others, I uh, marked the referendum's anniversary on uh, Monday. Um, I think uh, the point I was seeking to make, and we'll make again today, is that whatever divides us in this Parliament, and uh, there's many things that divide us in this Parliament, it should still be possible, as we proved 20 years ago, to try to find areas of agreement. Uh, and that should be true on the powers of this Parliament, just as it is true on other issues as well. And as I said on Monday, uh, to that end, we will publish in the coming months a series of papers uh, on extending the powers of our Parliament, not intended to be the final work, but to stimulate uh, debate. And I look forward to uh, discussing these across Parliament, as we do two things, both uh, seek to defend our current powers from the threat posed by the EU EU withdrawal bill, but also look in the light of Brexit and the other challenges we face as a country, what additional powers would allow uh, this Parliament to address those challenges and concerns even more effectively. Marie Todd. I thank the First Minister for your, that response. Damien Green has let the cat out of the bag and said explicitly that the UK Government plans to take control of Scottish agriculture at the very time when we should be celebrating the many achievements of this Parliament. The Tory party in Westminster are staging a power grab. Does the First Minister agree with me that their attempt to undermine this Parliament is completely unacceptable? First Minister. It is unacceptable. And you know, for those, and you know, I hear some grumbling on the Tory branches. I, I wasn't in the chamber for Mike Russell's statement the other day, but I did manage to catch some of it, and I actually thought the Tories were very constructive in their approach. So I, I hope we actually can find a way of working together to protect the powers of uh, our Parliament. Uh, you know, when you've got not just uh, the SNP Scottish Government, but the Labour Welsh Government, and many other organisations saying that in its current state, the EU withdrawal bill is unacceptable and represents a power grab on the devolved administrations. I do think the UK government should sit up, listen, take notice and agree to amendments. Um, you know, it can often be quite difficult because it, many of these issues around Brexit are highly technical. But as I said earlier on, what this bill does is reverse the very principle on which this parliament is founded. Uh, every power coming back from the EU uh, in devolved matters, instead of coming to this parliament, will go to Westminster. And that will allow the UK government to make decisions, whether in agriculture or fisheries or environment or a whole range, justice, in fact, uh, would be included in that. Uh, in 111 different areas that Mike Russell was talking about the other day, to take decisions on issues that are rightly devolved to this parliament. Now, whatever else we disagree on, surely we can all come together and agree yeah, yeah. that that is simply unacceptable and cannot be allowed to stand. That's the position of this government, and I hope we will have the backing of every other party in this parliament. Jackson Carlow. In that light, uh, in, can I ask the First Minister to reflect on the rhetoric she's deployed, both in response to Richard Lockhead and to Mary Todd? Her ministers warmly welcomed the offer we made, in all sincerity, on Tuesday to work with ministers to seek to find solutions to the issues the Scottish Government, which I believe now in all good conscience has raised, to the issues arising from the Withdrawal Bill. Uh, I'm concerned. Is it the First Minister's position that what she wants is a soapbox to promote a grievance agenda and to deploy rhetoric which is designed to scupper that? Or does she genuinely want to seek to find a solution to these problems? Can she give the Chamber an assurance that that is the case? Because what she's just said today almost seeks to undermine the spirit in which we have offered to work with our government to find that solution. First Minister. I'm genuinely not sure how much attention Jackson Carlow is being, being paying to this. And I, I, I don't mean that pejoratively. Because <laughs> while... This is a really serious point. Because while I do welcome the change of tone from the Conservatives on Tuesday, uh, surely Jackson Carlaw can understand, if he has been paying attention, that we've been trying to find solutions to this since early summer when the withdrawal bill was first published. We've been trying to find common ground and compromise with the UK government uh, since the referendum on the EU uh, more than a year ago. And all we have had at every step of the way are occasional warm words. But when push comes to shove, 
uh, the approach from the UK government has been it will be our way or no way. So with the greatest respect to Jackson Carlaw, yes, it is nice now to have a suggestion that the Scottish Tories might be on the side of protecting this parliament. But I'm sure he can forgive a degree of frustration on the part of the Scottish Government that thus far all the attempts we've been making to find compromise and common ground have been rejected by the UK Government. Now, if that's going to change now, I welcome that. But frankly, I want to see some of that in action rather than just, uh, if you forgive me, Jackson Carlaw, in rhetoric. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. We now move on to members' business in the name of Rachel Hamilton. And we'll just take a few moments for members to change seats.